Miriam Cates, thank you for joining me today. Good to be here. You are 39. Yes. You were born in Sheffield. You were educated at the local comprehensive school. When was the moment you decided you were a conservative? Um, <laughs> well, actually, relatively recently, because I've always been interested in politics from the age of about 11 or 12, but more interested in how Parliament works, democracy, different ideas and policies. I never really um, decided to join a party or choose one particular party over another. And actually, it was when thinking about wanting to stand for election that I started to think about which party I should join. And that was back in January 2018, so coming up three years. Um, and to cut a long story short, I joined the Conservatives to stand in local elections. Um, so that was when I decided that I was a Conservative and joined the party, so not that long ago. Have you always voted for the Conservative Party? No, I've voted for all sorts of parties since, my, since I was old enough to vote. And I, my earliest big political memory was the 1997 general election. I was 14. And of course, it was massive in Sheffield. Uh, it was known as the Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire, a very, very left-wing Labour, Labour place. And so that huge landslide uh, Labour victory was a, an incredible moment. And um, to be honest, I probably would have voted Labour that election had I been old enough to vote. So yes, I voted for all different parties. But I think, um, you know, when I looked at who, which party to join, obviously I had to look at the values of each party and I think I just didn't know them. I and mean, let's be honest, I probably couldn't have told you what each party stood for. Probably could have told you their policies or some of the personalities. Um, and I think something I read, I think it was David Cameron wrote in a newspaper article about um, conservatives believe that if you give people autonomy and control over their money, their lives, their family, their communities, they generally make good decisions. And that really chimed with me. I really believe that people should have power and say over how their lives are run. Um, and so that's why I joined the Conservatives. It's fascinating. It's fascinating that you weren't absolutely you know, clear or in, in, in the party that was going to be your party that you're going to represent in Parliament till, till really late on. It's unusual. Maybe it's, it's healthy. Yeah, well, it certainly makes it easier to defend to people why I'm a Conservative, because I suppose I've made that decision as an adult. I'm an adult convert, if you like, so I've had to look into it. But I think it's more about all political parties not being very good at communicating their values. I think we spend a lot of time telling people what our policies are, what we're going to do about X and Y, how much money we're going to spend on a particular issue, but actually what makes us tick, what are our values, what are our driving principles, I don't think we communicate that very well. And had, had I known that's what the Conservative Party believes, or certainly what a lot of Conservatives believe, I probably would have joined earlier, but I just didn't know until I started exploring it as an adult. So when you say you voted for all sorts of parties, uh, Labour, Liberal Democrat, Green? Yes, all of the above. All of the above. And Conservative. <laughs> I mean, I voted okay. tactically, as, as most people have, um, a lot. And, you know, for a large part of my adult life, I've been nappy changing, breastfeeding and not sleeping very much. That I probably didn't take as much of an interest as I should have during, you know, that period of my life. So I just wasn't, you know, I didn't know a lot about politics for a large proportion of recent history. But, um, but I do now, hopefully, or at least I'm learning. And you got married at 22. Yes. Really young. Well, it didn't seem odd at the time. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, met my husband, fell in love, wanted to get married. And actually, a lot of people in my family have got married young. I had children young, and I love that. You know, they're growing up now. They're all at school. I've got a teenager. Um, and, you know, I don't regret it for a moment. I think it was, it was brilliant. But, you know, everybody's families look differently, don't they? But that was the opportunity for me, and it's worked out well. Where did you meet your husband? I met him at our church, actually. I went to university in Cambridge and I came back to Sheffield to do a gap year. And he was already settled in Sheffield, having been to university here. And we met at our church where we were both working on a voluntary project together. You have faith. Is faith a big part of your life? Yes, a, ma a massive part of my life. And really, it is the reason I suppose I've ended up in politics. Um, I mean, all sorts of reasons. But I think that the, the motivation to want to work for making the world a better place, to work hard for other people, to, um, you know, to pass on those values, I suppose, very much comes from a faith perspective and, and believing that there's more, more to life than just what we see day to day. When did you discover your faith? Well, I was brought up in a Christian home and that was a big part of my um, upbringing, really. And particularly, I suppose, a very much a focus on on character and values and virtues. So I was quite a high achiever at school. I did really well in lots of things. You know, I was one of those lucky people who just enjoyed school and it really suited me. But what my parents really emphasized was character, how we treated each other, you know, whether we said sorry and forgave each other when we fall out, as all families do, um, honesty, integrity, those kind of things. And I suppose that, that's what I've, I've carried with me. I think 
You know, those things are so important in our, not just our personal lives, but in our national life as well. The virtues, the characters, it sounds really old fashioned, but actually if we treat each other properly, then everything else follows from that. So yeah, faith and the, the teachings that come out of it have played a big part in my life. And how do you practice your, your faith? Do, are you a church goer? Is it daily prayer? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, I, yeah, I'm church goer, read the Bible, you know, all those kind of um, things that people would see as religious. But for me, it's much more, it's much more alive than that. I suppose as a Christian, I think, yes, it's about reading the Bible, knowing about my faith, understanding theology and things like that. But it's more about a sense of purpose um, and having a living relationship um, with Jesus and, you know, just following that day by day. And I think it, it gives me a real strength because as politicians, as you know, we come under a, a lot of attack and frequently we make decisions where we're not actually 100% sure. You know, we weigh things up, but is this the right way to vote? And I think having that security of, of knowing that I believe in something bigger and something higher um, is, is really, really important and actually helps cope with the day-to-day the -day ups and downs of political life. Tell me about the biggest ups and then we might discuss the biggest downs. What are the biggest ups of political life? Well, it's so exciting. I mean, it is so interesting. No two days are the same. The things that you, you learn about uh, and become involved in are just amazing. And the influence that you have, I mean, I still find it amazing that anyone wants to publish anything I write, but you know, they do. And um, you know, obviously that's more about the position that I'm lucky enough to hold than, than necessarily what I have to say. But it is a, an, a position of enormous influence and privilege. And I really, you know, I don't think I'll ever, um, you know, I don't think that'll ever become uh, uh, commonplace to me. I mean, just the history of parliament walking in um, to the lobbies. And it is just the, almost a spiritual feeling of what's gone before. Um, and just, you know, it's very intellectually challenging. Uh, you work with some incredible people. I mean, my team are just amazing, other MPs. Uh, it's a very, very, um, you know, exciting place to be. So that's definitely one one of the highs. Uh, and being elected, of course, was, a, was an amazing moment. Um, I mean, the lows are very much, I mean, the partly workload, that was a real, real shock. I was a stay-at-home mum, really, before I got elected. So to then go to working way more than full-time um, was challenging. But I think, it, it, you know, the abuse and the social media and the fact that one day I was a kind of person involved in my local community, the PTA, parish councillor, um, you know, playing with kids in the park, and the next day you're almost a legitimate figure of, of public abuse. That was really hard, because I hadn't changed. I was the same person. Uh, but you, you know, you get over it and you learn to cope with it, but that's probably one of the lows, definitely. Have you ever felt frightened? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've had nowhere near the um, issues that some of my colleagues have. I mean, some of my colleagues have got harrowing stories, really, really have, and I haven't had anything that bad. But I, you know, I had an experience where some, but he was trying to incite Twitter users to share my address online. I had to move family out of the, my family home while the police got involved. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, you learn to live with it, but you do feel, you do feel exposed. And I think the other thing is that you don't, you're not ready for when you stand for election is that you're gonna put your face on 40,000 leaflets and deliver them around the constituency. Everybody knows who you are because you've advertised yourself for obvious reasons. And so you never, you're always aware that people know who you are, see what you're doing, um, you know, that, that can be unnerving to start with until you get used to it. So you, you were a, a science teacher. Everyone thinks all teachers are lefties. Is that just a caricature of teachers? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to cast aspersions on my former colleagues, but um, I mean, I think certainly if you look at the polling data, teachers vote for more left-wing parties. Um, I think it's difficult. I mean, when I was a teacher, it, Michael Goh's reforms were going through and they weren't popular at the time. Um, you know, we, we, we know that, although personally, I think they were very important reforms. Um, I think it's difficult. I, I think it's a, in the public sector, obviously, you're very focused on the job you're doing and the difficulties that you see. Um, and I think having then experienced the private sector, because my husband runs a business and I've been a little bit involved in that, and you see the risks that people in the private sector have to take in order to create the profit that then pays the taxes to fund the economy, you get a very different perspective. And I actually think we'd have a lot more political balance if people had to work in both sectors and, and uh, appreciate both. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of left-wing teachers, but they're not all left-wing. I think I've got three or four colleagues, conservative colleagues who were teachers, so on, the, on our benches. So maybe we're making progress. And you said that 
you were a stay-at-home mum largely before you entered Parliament. So just, just talk me through the years of when you were a stay-at-home mum. Although I really enjoyed the job, teaching is so inflexible. You can't have the morning off to take your child to for their first day at school, or if your child is ill, it's really, um, you know, it's really challenging. And it just felt the right time to step back while the kids were young and focus on them. Um, and I was intending to go back to teaching when the youngest, our youngest started school, but political opportunity came along and I didn't. So that's kind of how it all fitted together. So I probably would have gone back to teaching had I not come into politics. So you're married, you have three children. Do you try and keep your personal life and political life separate or does your family life teach you what you should be doing in politics? Yeah, that's a really good question. And certainly my experience of family and community has a massive impact on what I'm involved in in politics. Because I think that if you've lived a relatively normal life of taking your kids to school every day, having to get in a doctor's appointment, um, volunteering for the school disco, those kind of things, you have a real understanding of how the vast majority of families in this country live. And I think that's so important in Parliament to put that perspective. Um, so I've been involved in Andrea Ledson's early years review, looking at what, how we can give children the best start in life in that first two years. You know, and I've got personal recent experience of health visitors and midwives and community groups and those kind of things. And I think, I think that is, of course, we need people from all walks of life, but I think that is really valuable to have mums of school-aged children um, in Parliament. So yes, I do use my family experience. Do I try and keep it separate? Yes, uh, I try and keep my children away from anything where they might be identified or, um, or come into to risk, obviously. But I do try and protect family time. I mean, it's hard because it's a, in sometimes it's a 24 seven job, isn't it? And sometimes things happen that you can't, you have to be involved in. But yeah, I do try and separate the two. And um, you know, my children aren't that interested in what I do yet. So that's fairly easy at home. Must have seen you on the telly. Yes, but they now see that as normal. That's what's so strange, especially my youngest. You know, it's quite a big part of his life now. And my daughter was showing me that she had a grammar, a grammar exercise and she had to put in a, I don't know my grandma, a noun writes a newspaper article and she just put my mum <laughs> instead of a journalist. It was just really bizarre, but you know, it's just, yeah, it's quite normal for them now. They're okay with it, I think. You recently wrote an article in The Telegraph um, and, and here's a, an extract from, from that. It was about women and feminism. If we erode the very concept of women, for example, by saying that trans women are women, or by denying the importance of biological sex, we erase the rights of women. I tell you what struck me about that paragraph. I, I was struck, tell me why you put, by saying that trans women are women, in the same sentences, or by denying the importance of biological sex. I think quite different. Is it possible to believe in one, but to believe in the other two? Uh, well, I think if you, if you define woman as, um, uh, in a biological sense, an adult human female, and if you accept that you can't change your sex, as in you can't change your body from male to female, certainly you can't change your genetics from male to female or back to front, or, or the other way around, um, then that is almost the same as saying you can't deny biological sex. So if you take a biological view of it that you are born, 99.99% .99 of us are born either male or female. Uh, and I, you know, as a scientist, don't think you can do anything about it from that point. Now, obviously, you know, adults in this country, it's a free society, you should be free to live and present how you want and be treated with respect and dignity and have equal rights and be free from discrimination. Absolutely, that's right. So if a man wants to live as a woman, as an adult, absolutely should be able to do that and without discrimination. Where it becomes difficult is when that starts to um, impose on, on women's sex-based rights. And let's remember there are real reasons why we have sex-based rights. And although we have equality between men and women in this country in the law, and that's a really good thing, women will always be vulnerable in certain areas um, because we are less powerful than men. And let, you know, let's remember, I'm not making a moral point here, but sex crimes generally are committed almost always by men against women. And so there are certain points where you have to keep women separate. And that's right for our dignity and our protection. And I think you know, this isn't a point about trans women. I'm not at all saying that trans women are a danger. I'm saying if we start to say that you can self-identify as 
any sex you want, any gender you want, then we inherently have a problem and a conflict with women's rights. And that's something we need to talk about and not be afraid of talking about, and something we need to come to a consensus upon that is sensible and logical uh, and scientific. And I think the problem with the debate at the moment has become so toxic and so difficult um, that people who have one particular view are almost afraid to speak up. So I think we need to start speaking about it calmly, but, uh, but sensibly. I just feel like I should say this because some... Um, trans women will think, but, but I'm a woman because I've transitioned. Is that, do, yeah. do you get that? Yeah, and I think there's certainly an argument for saying that somebody who's transitioned, who's medically and surgically, and been living as a woman for X number of years, why shouldn't they use the women's toilets? Of course, but when you're, if, you, if you're talking about self-ID or somebody who's, let's say, gender fluid, you're basically saying that you can make that decision of, I'm a woman without going through any of that. And then that in itself, if that's society-wide, presents a danger. If you can go into a woman's changing room uh, as a male-bodied person, then even if you obviously are not a danger yourself, there's still a perceived danger and threat and discomfort and lack of dignity to women. And if you think about in prisons, where women don't have a choice about being there, then you start to get into all sorts of difficulties, um, which, you know, again, I think we need to talk about and be real about. You're not on Twitter. That must make you, I mean, you are certainly in a small minority of MPs who are not on Twitter. Did you try it and decide you didn't like it or did you decide you were never going there? Yes, I did try it. So I've never been a big Twitter user. I mean, um, Facebook was where it's at for, you know, in where I live and doing what I was doing and being a mum and sharing photos and those kind of things. I did join Twitter as a candidate because I thought it was the thing to do. Um, but as it got towards the election, over the election and just past the election, the level of abuse that I was getting was just so much that it was, it was traumatic, it, was, it felt dangerous, and I couldn't see the point of it. And even though I stopped looking at comments, my staff still had to look at it, and that was really, really unpleasant for them. And then you have to decide what do you report to the police, and you know. And I just thought, what's the point? Why? Who am I communicating with on Twitter? Because most of my constituents aren't on it, and I can communicate with them in my surgeries, in, through email, on the phone, Facebook, local newspaper. I don't need Twitter to be a constituency MP. So I just deleted the account, and I'm really glad I did. I do occasionally think, you know, as goes back to what we we're saying about influence. If we want to, if I want to have an influence for good, you need to think about these things from time to time. Should I have a Twitter profile? But at the moment, I'm, you know, I'm happy as I am. I think. Final question: Would you like to lead your party? Can't think of a worse job at the moment. I mean, it's that it's the it's the question that every MP gets asked: Would you like to be prime minister? No, I wouldn't like to be prime minister. If the opportunity came about and there was you know, it was the right thing to do, then I suppose I might do it. But right now, I can't think of a worse job, to be honest. It's pretty hard going, isn't it? Liam Cates, thank you for sharing the real you with me. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.